Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 129th video cast, 119th podcast coming to you straight from Tampa, Florida. Both girls have swim meets this weekend and next weekend, their major meets. So uh, we're excited to be down here and working remotely with our three screens set up and we're ready to go. Uh, when in Tampa, you definitely want to hit the classic Burns Steakhouse. It's been around over 60 years. Uh, that's my eldest daughter, Mimi, loving the oysters as always and the big porterhouse. Uh, I went with the Wagyu. It was unbelievable, and this is definitely something you got to check out. Not only that, after you finish, they have a whole separate restaurant in a restaurant upstairs with like a 10-page menu for desserts. Uh, that was absolutely phenomenal. So uh, great to be back in Tampa, and let's get right down to it. So um, first off, I want to thank Liz Clayman and Ellie Terrett for having me on Fox Business, The Clayman Countdown. Uh, that was on Wednesday of this week, and we went into, uh, we'll go into this in further detail in the article of the week, but a lot about the Fed and opportunities moving forward. So thanks to Liz and Ellie. Uh, also would like to thank Annie Palmer and Sarah Alessand Alessandrini from CNBC for including me in their article on Tesla and Elon Musk uh, actually going on the board of Twitter. And uh, the key quote that I made in this article, which proved to be prescient, was, uh, quote, the stake could become active at any time, said Tom Hayes, chairman of Great Hill Capital. I think Twitter is being proactive by putting him out on the board before he demands it. And then um, uh, I, you know, I, I uh, went on to say a bunch of other quotes. You can check this out. But what was funny is literally six hours later after I spoke with Annie, on the phone, uh, and she published this article, uh, Musk changed his filing from a 13G to a 13D and became an activist. So uh, that's all you need to know. And uh, that was fun to be part of that. Also, I want to thank Ann Berry and Mike Teak over at public.com. Public is an app like Robinhood. Robinhood. Uh, it's growing like a weed. And they asked me to come on and do their opening bell this morning. Uh, from 9.15 to 9.30, I was able to jump on. We covered a huge amount of stuff in a short period of time. So definitely check that out, all about the Fed, what happened this week with the uh, bond purchase uh, bond purchase roll-off, excuse me, quantitative tightening start, starting implications and opportunities around that. So that was a lot of fun. I uh, want to thank Bansari Kamdar and Praveen Paramas Paramasavam for including me in their um, article on Reuters this week. And um, this was a very important quote. We're going to uh, come into it. Uh, the two-year yield and the 10-year yield actually inverted. Last week, we were talking about like it did an intraday. Was it a real thing? Was it not? It's real. It inverted. So uh, what I said was, quote, while the inversion is bad news in the sense that it's a very accurate indicator of a recession, the good news is historically it's been a buy signal versus a sell signal in the short term. On average, markets tend to peak about a year and a half after the 210 spread inverts. So we'll talk more about that. Um, I want to thank Ellen Chang over at thestreet.com who included me in two of her articles on biotech. These you definitely want to read. Click here to read it at thestreet.com. Uh, literally, it, you know, she gave me like uh, three quarters of the article to lay out the case for biotech. Uh, we think it's going to be a huge, huge opportunity here. And, um, you know, we went into lowest price to sales ratio in over a decade. Why they're down is because of rate fears. We're going to talk about that. Uh, um, we talked about the different ratios trading at a discount to book, uh, dramatic discount to price to operating cash flow and uh, discount to forward PE, uh, average multiple since 1986, and then the M&A catalyst and uh, the uh, doctor visit catalyst moving forward. So, so this is just a huge opportunity. She did a second article, follow-up article on it uh, with regard to the M&A catalyst factor. So do check that out. Thanks to Ellen Chang over at thestreet.com. And then I wanna thank Nivedita Balu for including me in her article. Uh, this was also about Twitter. I said it does send the message to Twitter. Having a meaningful stake in the company will keep them on their toes. 
because that passive stake could very quickly become an active stake and it, and it did literally the next day. Um, so that's that on the media front. Also, um, Subrat Patnaik reached out from Bloomberg today and he said, we are expecting NASDAQ again to rack up a trillion dollars in losses. I was hoping to learn what your read was on the tech stocks. Some bulls are saying that tech stocks are already oversold. Valuations are still very high. What's your take on this? With the Fed hike jitters persisting, what are some of the other factors in play according to you? And what are the most vulnerable subsectors in the NASDAQ uh, according to you? So uh, basically what I told Subrat is um, that tech is jittery as rates are climbing. We think we're nearing a peak in yields as foreign demand will step in at these levels while the Fed begins to exit. Our relative yields are now very attractive to foreign investors who can borrow in yen or euros and buy U.S. treasuries. U.S. aggregate bonds are trading near their largest discount to par in over three decades. We're going to go into that chart right now. Um, uh, the other uh, thing I pointed to was the long-term cha uh, chart of the TLT, which was in our article of the week, now approaching a trend line. We think that's probably going to hold. And then as we move into seasonality around bonds, uh, the seasonality of bonds also starts to turn after tax season as the treasury coffers fill up with money from tax receipts and they don't have to engage in as much new issuance to fund the cost of government. So we're moving into a seasonally strong, people, uh, strong part of the year. Bonds tend to rally from April through October. Uh, and I think this year will be no different. Um, as far as the divergence of different tech stocks, there's significant diver difference among tech stocks. Quote, innovation stocks that have come down 50 to 90% over the past year are in many cases still losing money and still trading at 10 to, 10 to 20 times sales. They are not cheap and may never recover to previous highs. Value slash old line tech, think HP, which Buffett just bought a ton of, uh, Intel, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, Qualcomm, Facebook, etc. Cash gener generating companies are now plentiful with many trading at or below market multiples while growing earnings at a faster pace than the general market. Um, another sector that's been decimated by rate fears in recent months is biotech. This is overblown and will reverse as rates stabilize in coming weeks. And then I went through the whole case for the biotech sector. Um, so uh, that's the story there. Um, as far as the uh, public.com interview, you may want to listen in for some stats about yield curves inversions over the last 100 years. Also covered that on the claim and countdown, so check out those two, uh, and I think you'll find those interviews helpful. Uh, quote of the week is from Peter Lynch. Time is on your side when you own shares of superior companies. Now, you also want to co couple this with uh, this clip that... Um, uh, Presley, my marketing assistant, put out this week on Twitter from Warren Buffett. And the concept here was, yeah, you own these great companies and then you go through these days and weeks where they do nothing and it's kind of boring. And what, uh, what Presley put out is uh, PSA, great investing is boring, probably not what you want to hear, but it's the truth. And here, is it, here it is from the master himself, Warren Buffett. My next one. Yeah, and the, and, and the thing that makes great investing boring is sometimes those high quality companies uh, can move against you in the short term, number one, and or number two, do nothing for a number of months, and then they hockey stick and you double your money. And sometimes while you're waiting for that inflection, um, people get antsy because you still have to send them the quarterly reports. You still have to say, this is why we still like this company. And when it changes, it changes all at once and it changes overnight and it changes in a massive way. And, uh, and that's exactly what Buffett's talking about here. Um, we're we're going to get to the uh, ask me anything questions at the end of this. Um, but uh, but this is this is a perfect example of that um, moving forward. So now want to talk about uh, here's an article in The Wall Street Journal. 
uh, about biotech stocks. Here's the headline. Biotech stocks, one's booming, enter bear market territory. Uh, newsflash, the sector is down 50% in the last year. Bear market is 20%. So this is kind of opinion follows trend. Everyone gets negative before the inflection. This is from Joseph Walker. And I love the quote at the end, though, because it was a balanced article. Um, okay, this regard relates to the M&A that we've talked about. So he says deals have slowed partly slowed down partly because it's been easier for biotechs to raise money from IPOs or follow on uh, sales of new stocks at Bruce Booth, partner at venture capital firm Atlas. Many pharmaceutical companies were scared off from doing deals because of how expensive biotech had become. So this was going up to from the 2020 to 2021 peak when the Fed backstop the market, six trillion pumped into the economy. Uh, there was no reason for deals because biotech companies were, were flush. Um, he goes on to say, now most of us would say we anticipate more M&A in the next three quarters of 2022, in part because those valuations have come back down to what we uh, might be a more appealing range for business development groups at large phar pharma companies. Uh, this is what we've been saying. The 14 largest pharmaceutical companies by market cap, including Pfizer, J&J, &J, faced a loss of tens of billions of dollars in revenue over the next decade from patent expirations on branded drugs and have a combined $650 billion in capacity to do deals this year, according to Ronnie Gal, Bernstein and Company analyst. This is exactly the point that we've been making. Quote, the big pharma companies all have big holes in their pipelines and are looking to fill them with acquisitions, said Mr. Gal. When pharma begins to pull the trigger, you should see the biotechs begin to turn upward again. And this is the key point. And that's why we've been talking about XBI, Labu. We like the small mid caps because they're going to be the bite sized targets for, that, for the game to uh, risk the animal spirits to come back into the sector. And we think that's going to happen imminently as uh, yields start to peak out on the 10 year. And we're going to move right into that. Now, the other thing that I liked, Josh Nathan Kazis over at Barron's put out this uh, headline article. Biotech stocks have taken a beating. Here's how to play a rebound. And he goes through the whole thing. He talks about 36% uh, of the uh, XBI ETF trading at three times cash or less. 16% trading at two times cash or less. And I've said in the past, over 100 biotech companies now trading at a discount to cash. And he, he quotes some analysts saying that, uh, you know, uh, uh, at two times cash is always the bottom, that type of thing. And now we're seeing some one times cash. So, so it's good to see it in Barron's. It's starting to, people are starting to pay attention. And that's usually what you see right before big inflection. Um, this was the big announcement of the week. China... Uh, decided to actually give U.S. basic full access to audits of most firms. So they finally blinked on that front. That was the good news. The bad news is they've got, you know, rolling shutdowns happening in Shanghai, which put a damper on it. The PMIs were hurt as a result. And this is a perfect example of what we talked about last week when you have a, a $500,000 rental. Uh, and um, actually, I was talking to my friend we met for lunch. He was in from, from uh, Montana this week. Um, and, uh, you know, you have a $500,000 rental. If it goes vacant for two weeks, for two months, and you get no income, would you take the first offer at $400,000 or $350,000 for the rental property? And the answer is no, that's absolutely crazy. Uh, and that's exactly what we're seeing in China. And we'll, we'll address it in some of the Ask Me Anything questions. Oh, the PMI is down. Oh, the shutdowns. Yeah. So, Sales are going to be down for the next month or two. So what? What you're, what we're buying is a high quality business on a normalized basis. At, you know that's been impacted by the regulatory crackdowns, now the shutdowns, the pandemic, blah blah blah. But when we look at at all of that starting to roll off, namely one, the tech crackdowns, and then two, in the next month or so, the shutdowns, as we saw with Omicron, was basically January was the big month of. Uh, slowing, uh, these things revert back up to trend. They still have the same share. So just as they're getting hit with shutdowns, so are their competitors. And when things normalize and that pent up demand comes back, compounded, by the way, by a tremendous amount of stimulus that's built up in the system since October and November, which is going to flood out uh, as, uh, as their lockdowns wind down, 
uh, they're going to continue to gain share. If anything, they gain more share because the little players can't make it through the shutdowns. They go out of business and the big players like BABA uh, and Tencent pick up more and more share and, and more and more value. So yeah, you can, get, you can get faked out and scared out by like the PMI and the shutdown, which is going to you know, be of impact for the next month or so. Uh, or you can say, yeah, maybe the, the property was vacant for the last two months, but I'm not taking a $400,000 bid or or $350,000 bid because I lost two months of income. I know it's going to get, get rented and it's worth more than $500,000. So why would I ever consider selling it? And yet people do it every single day of the week in the stock market. Somehow they treat uh, the earnings power of businesses different than the earnings power of every asset just because it has a public ticker and trades in you know emotional mania on the ups and the downs. I consider that huge opportunity. Many people consider that reasons to get in and out of stocks when it moves against them or it moves for them. Uh, and the name of the game is you want to go into high quality businesses, determine what you think their fair value is. And we've covered that many times in terms of the biotech sector, in terms of Alibaba. Uh, and then you just ignore the short term uh, manic depressive nature of the stock market, as Ben Graham talked about in The Intelligent Investor. And as it approaches your, your uh, assessment of fair value uh, in a normalized environment back to trend, you start to lay off because at those levels, that's when everyone else starts to get excited. And by then you're up 1x, 2x, 3x, and you help them out when they can't uh, get enough of your stock, when everyone's excited about it. Uh, you know, we uh, doing what we do, we buy from pessimists and we sell to optimists. Uh, we'll know when the optimists are back in the market. Right now, they still have pessimists, so it's an opportunity to be, to be adding, not subtracting, and that's what we continue to do. So uh, this is from Seth Golden uh, at Twitter. You can see his handle here. 15 days from the latest 52-week low, the NASDAQ has already retraced 56% of its decline. There have been 12 retracements of 25% or more after 15 days from a low in the uh, NASDAQ composite history. Over the next two months, there was only one loss. Risk reward was massively skewed to the upside. So you can go through that. This just uh, talks about what we've been uh, pounding the table on. Not now that it's up 56%. When it was down here and everyone was puking out tech and, and running for the hills, we were saying this was an opportunity to step in. Uh, and that certainly proved to be the case. And now that everyone's scared off by this uh, little Fed stuff this week, uh, it's an opportunity to add more and there's, there's more things to do. I think, as I said, on public today, we're going to work up to new highs and on uh, the claim and countdown, uh, work up to new highs over the coming months. And no one had been positioned to that and no one is still positioned to that. And the Johnny come lately's who chased the 56% retracements uh, uh, have now gotten shaken out this week. We'll, we'll add where appropriate from, from the weak hands. And uh, as we push to new highs, once we get to new highs, everyone will start jumping in and that's when we'll be laying off stock. And this is, you know, this is rinse repeat stuff, guys. This is not because we're clairvoyants, our, our crystal ball, we leave that in the closet. We just look for market signals and when they lay themselves out, we probabilistically wait. Nothing is a certain guarantee, but, uh, but the odds are, were skewed in our favor. They continue to be in certain sectors. Uh, consider buying these growth stocks as real rates remain negative. This is from Citi. So this analyst came out with a note, Chris uh, uh, Montague. He expects real rates to remain negative going forward, which should provide a huge backstop uh, uh, for growth stocks. We agree. Um, this is a great article from uh, Vivian Lu Chen. On market watch, U.S. government bonds just suffered their worst quarter of the past half century. Here's why some prize investors may not be phased. Uh, okay, historically, so you can see how bad the quarter was. Uh, historically, when we've had nasty quarters, the next quarter tends to be pretty good. FHN financial chief economist Chris Lowe said via phone. The thing about bonds that's different from stocks and commodities is that bond price, prices can't go down forever. If they did, the economy would eventually stop functioning. Eventually, they are self-correcting. Uh, we agree here. U.S. government bonds lost 5.6% in the first quarter, showing the uh, worst showing since uh, <clears throat> record keeping began in 1973, according to Bloomberg U.S. Treasury Total Return Index. And the 10-year Treasury note just completed its seventh worst quarter since the U.S. Civil War, according to Jim Reed of Deutsche Bank. 
citing that includes the 10, 10 year notes equivalents back to 1865. So, um, so yeah, there, there's no question here. Uh, and I think the most important chart that I'm gonna show you this week is right here, the, which I just covered um, uh, regarding um, Subrat's request from Bloomberg. Uh, this is the seasonality of the long bond uh, TLT ticker uh, for the ETF holders. And it shows that <clears throat> as we get into March, April period, when the tax receipts start to come in, uh, bonds start to get bid. We just came off the weakest period of the year for bonds, which is uh, January, February, and March. And then uh, it just straight up seasonally, this is the average for the last uh, 20, 19 years since, uh, 19 years through the end of 2021. Uh, bonds tend to go straight up, which means yields come down between now and October. And then you enter a period of weakness again from October. So October, November, December, January, February, March is the weakest period of the year for bonds. This year was no different. Everyone's acting like it's different. But um, one of the points that I made in Liz's show was to put it in perspective. Um, you know, 10-year yields, I think today hit 271 before backing off a bit. Um, we peaked in October of 2018 at 325. We peaked in January of 2014 on the 10-year at 303. So we're not even there. And the market did incredibly well in both of those periods, 2014, then it rallied another year. So um, so, so people are, are just overshooting and mostly they're just caught off sides with too much leverage is really what it comes down to. And, uh, and that'll work itself out in short order. So, um, okay, this is um, Buffett taking the, the stake in HP. So he's buying value tech, which we've been talking about. Um, Fed plots to start shrinking balance sheet in May sooner and more than expected. Um, this was, uh, as I said to Liz, this was telegraphed in the uh, press conference from the last Fed meeting. Powell said they would begin uh, reducing the balance sheet as quickly as May, and they're going to do that uh, with a $95 billion cap. They'll work up to it over a few months, $60 billion in treasuries, $30 billion in MBS. The good news is they're following my advice. They're focusing on selling off the long end of the curve, uh, which is re-steepening the curve, by the way. It's gone from negative six basis points inversion this week to positive 20 basis points. So that means credit will start to flow. I do believe we, we will get a shallow recession, as I said on Fox, in 2023 because we did invert uh, mid to late 2023. I think it's going to be very shallow, though. And I think that um, uh, they may be able to engineer a soft landing if they re-steepen the curve quickly enough. Uh, that it will be a very shallow recession just off a of high baseline effects because we had such high GDP growth off a of low base and then, then it'll be harder to beat those. So maybe you get a quarter or two of negative GDP uh, and that will be it. But I think we're moving into, you know, we're within a secular bull driven by the millennials. We've talked about this many times. I think the biggest problem was the big mouths of the FOMC members jawboning, trying to bring long-term inflation expectations down or keep them contained jawboning these 50 basis point hikes at the exact wrong time when the Bank of Japan was in the market last year defending 25 basis points on the 10 year and we unnecessarily inverted uh, and um, you know if they just kept their mouth shut uh, and uh, done the long end steepening as we had discussed uh, we may have never inverted so uh, but everything is generally favorable and I, I think that you're going to see inflation start to come down uh, sooner than most people think. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. So um, moving right along. Uh, this is an article from uh, Market Watch by Steve Goldstein. And he's basically talking about textbook recovery from the Ukraine invasion so far. And he's talking about how the market behaved during the Iraq war when you get the first 
uh, invasion, then you know the market's down, and then it just slowly works up over time. Wars tend to actually, you know, historically be bullish because there's a lot of economic activity, uh, even though obviously the human atrocities are nothing to be happy or bullish about. It's the economic ac activity in the background. So, uh, so we're tracking right along. This implies more upside. We agree. Um, here, what to buy following the epic bond route? Um, top ranked. Uh, this is this is the article about inflation. So, with consumer prices rising at seven point nine percent annual rate, most bond yields don't come close to matching the recent inflation reading. Still, negative real yields could prove transitory if inflation headwinds lower by the end of 2022. Top-ranked financial economist Nancy Lazar of Cornerstone Mac Macro thinks the biggest surprise will be that core inflation, which excludes food and energy costs, could be down to 2% by the end of 2022 as economic growth slows to 1% and many goods experience price deflation. 99% uh, of individual investors think rates are going higher, says Bryn Torkelson of Matisse Capital. But a lot of that is already priced into the markets. We agree on both fronts. Um, and uh, it shows the year-to-date total return of these different uh, classes of bonds from municipals to treasuries to corporates to junk bonds uh, to preferreds to convertible securities uh, and then their current yield. So you can see there's going to be a lot of money that starts to step in when you have yields at these levels, uh, particularly foreign demand, as we've uh, anticipated and discussed in previous weeks. Um, this is from Mark Holbert, Holbert over at Market Watch. He puts out this very interesting t table. He goes, the chart below plots the 10-year yield over the past decade on this after tax and after inflation basis. To construct the chart, I relied on the researcher's adjustment factor for taxes on a Cleveland Federal Reserve model to adjust for inflation expectations. This model, which I've written about before, has a number of inputs, including treasury yields, surveys of professional forecasters, and the prices of inflation swaps. And it says interest rates now above average. Uh, notice that on this basis, the current 10-year yield is above the past 10-year average. Indeed, in recent days, it closed above zero for the first time in three years, what the model predicts. Given this, don't be surprised if interest rates on this double-adjusted basis come down in coming months. Indeed, if we assume that adjusted interest rates are mean reverting, then there's a greater chance of such a decline than, than of an increase. Note that the decline would come for any of several reasons. A decline in nominal interest rates is just one way. Another would be for expected inflation to rise without a corresponding increase in nominal rates. Regardless of how it comes about, such a decline would be welcome news for bond investors on an after-tax and after-inflation basis, and we agree with that as well. Um, this is from Bespoke, and we've talked about used cars in recent podcasts. He says, how much will the recent drop in used car prices impact upcoming CPI reports? You can go here for further details, but it is going to have an impact. Uh, you're seeing it already on um, freight rates and trucking numbers peaking and a number of things that are starting to roll over. So um, we continue to expect inflation to moderate and go back toward tre trend, but will be above trend closer to 3% versus, versus uh, his, a recent trend of 2%. Uh, and we're perfectly okay with that. Uh, this is just the yield curve, twos, tens. It went down to negative six. It's at plus 19 now. So they're re-steepening the curve quickly, trying to pull off this type of stick save like in 1994. Not sure they'll be able to do it after the full inversion, but they're on the right track, focusing on the long end of the curve. Um, the market has 80.8% chance of a 50 basis point hike priced in right now. I think the likelihood of the stick save increases dramatically. If they undershoot on the hikes, i.e. they only do 25 basis points in May, but they get going with the uh, balance sheet reduction, then I would then I'd probably say we may even avert a, a shallow recession in 2023. I don't think they'll do that. I think there's a lot of pressure for them to do 50 basis points because everyone acts in, in with looking in the rear view mirror versus through the windshield and everyone's emotional about inflation right now, and you have an election coming up, and yada, yada, yada. So I think they're going to push the envelope on that, which will ensure uh, a modest recession. 
which has nothing to do with what the market's going to do in the short term. We think the market's up and it works to new highs. Um, okay, moving right along, we went through the seasonality of that. Here's the long-term trend line, which we covered this week. This is the 20-year uh, plus treasury bond. This is going back 20 years. And you can just see we're right now on the trend line here where we hit and bounce and hit and bounce. We think this is going to be the same thing. We think this trend line should hold. Bond should start to go up. Yield should start to come down in coming weeks. And this um, uh, kind of acute phase that we saw this week with everyone worrying about uh, balance sheet roll off, et cetera, uh, is going to be uh, alleviated. Um, okay, this is from Jason Gopfert, uh, G-O-E-P-F-E-R-T. He says, according to Bloomberg calculations, U.S. aggregate bonds are about to trade at a 32 record discount to par. What we see here, this is the uh, U.S. aggregate uh, total return value uh, index from Bloomberg. Uh, every time it got down to these levels since uh, 19, so we're going on 30 years, um, 32 years in this chart, every single time was a buy opportunity in bonds, which meant yields compressed, which means what? Tech, biotech, China tech, emerging markets will start to get rebid. They've fallen in anticipation of what ha was announced this week. They'll now start to uh, sell the rumor. It was a sell the rumor, buy the news, as we said on multiple uh, appearances this week. And that the same is going to be the case. So, um, you know, would we buy bonds? No, um, because we just, we just, we, you know, that's not what we do. But would we buy things that do well when bonds start to get bid, like value tech, like biotech, like China tech, like emerging markets? You bet your bottom dollar, no question about it. And we're betting our bottom dollar. So that's the name of the game. Uh, moving right along here, uh, we are already at the article of the week. Wow, we are moving with some, some uh, speed this week. This is good. The Shake It Off stock market and sentiment results. This is uh, Taylor Swift. We've used this song in the past <laughs> in other times where the uh, similar conditions have existed. Uh, in August uh, 19th, 2014, she wrote her song Shake It Off. It was nominated for three Grammys in 2015 and named one of the top uh, 10 songs that define the 2010s by USA Today. The key lyrics that relate to the current state of the stock market as follows. Haters going to hate, 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 hate. Baby, I'm just going to shake, 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 shake. I shake it off. I shake it off. And that's exactly what the market's doing to the dismay of perma bears. While the market grapples with a war in Ukraine, persistent inflation, a hawkish Fed, a yield curve that just inverted, and a global rolling wave of pandemic shutdowns like we're seeing in Shanghai, the S&P is down just 4.3% year to date maybe a little bit less as of today. Um, now, um, I go through the um, appearance on Fox Business on Wednesday. These were my show notes ahead of it. I talked about, uh, that I went on an hour after they released the Fed minutes, talking about the um, uh, schedule for the bond, uh, the balance sheet roll off. And I said, the market was down on this news, big intraday. I said, uh, Liz, I think this is an instance of sell the rumor, buy the news. That's proving to be uh, uh, correct. And um, this was telegraphed. Um, I put in perspective the yields at that point were 263 relative to our peaks in 2018 and 2023. Uh, the good news is the market can still work up to new highs. Uh, the bad news is that we probably get the shallow recession. And um, and the reason that is, is largely just like we saw uh, coming out of the pandemic with all the stimulus, it took about six to 12 months to hit the economy. The same thing will be the tightening. So they started tightening. They did their first 25 basis point hike last month. You know, six to 12 months out, you're going to start to feel it in the economy. Then you may get one or two quarters of negative GDP growth off of high bases. We covered the uh, uh, different yield curve inversions. The bottom line is the historically the 210 inversion tends to be a short-term buy signal, not a sell signal as the recession comes a year and a half after. And the last four times, the market peaked 17 months after the inversion with an average return of 28.8%. Uh, we talked about uh, sick, uh, uh, getting involved in biotech. The reason is we wanna be in sectors that have reasonable valuations, number one, and number two can thrive in a slowing growth environment and have a low correlation to GDP. 
Keep in mind, GDP is going to drop from 5.9% last year to probably 35 to 3.8% this year. Biotech fits the bill because unlike cyclicals, which require accelerating GDP to flourish, those of you listening to me in 2020, you remember I said GDP was going to grow 6% next year. This was when everyone was talking about negative, you know, uh, 20% unemployment, negative GDP. I said with this new stimulus announcement, you're going to see in 2021, GDP is going to grow 6%. It did 5.9%. No one thought that was going to happen. And the same thing's going to happen on the flip side. With the tightening, uh, we're going to feel that 6 to 12 months, and we're going to uh, move GDP back down to trend, 3.5, 3.8 this year, and probably you know 2 to 3 next year as a result of the, the tightening. Uh, so this these groups... Um, uh, while cyclicals require accelerating GDP to flourish, biotech has a low correlation and biotech valuations are historically low relative to their average multiples. We've covered this many times uh, to get back to price to book, to get back to price to operating cash flow, they'd have to appreciate 155%. Uh, and this is, uh, this is one of our top two positions along with Alibaba. Um, and, um, and this is the lowest price to sales in over a decade, which the Bar Barron's article covered as well as the catalyst, the doctor visits, the M&A, et cetera. Uh, so other indicators we're looking at this week, we may be close to a short-term peak in bond yields, uh, and uh, we covered that. This is from Quantifiable ed Edges. Uh, the uh, seven to 10 year treasury is in its worst drawdown of all time. Here's the historical drawdown chart of yesterday's close, another half a percent today. I think this was on Thursday. And uh, we love to buy in these periods of acute panic. We're not buying bonds. We're buying things that will do well when yields peak and bonds start to get bid again uh, and continue to stay bid for the next six to nine months. Um, okay, our relative yields are becoming too attractive to foreign buyers at these. Okay, we covered that. Uh, any relief in yields will begin to favor that which no one is currently positioned for. Number one, biotech. And number two, value low multiple tech as everyone has crowded into cyclicals in the past few few weeks and months and dumped their tech. The pain trade is up for these two groups. Uh, this is from a, a guy over at Sentiment Trader, Jay Capel. Uh, another week of aggressive open market buying by corporate insiders of the NASDAQ 100 index companies, which again raises the question, number one, are they crazy? Number two, or do they know something we don't? And number three, should the bullish case be given the benefit of the doubt? And he goes through the, quantified, uh, the quantitative data going all the way back a decade. Every time insiders in tech were buying this much stock, it was a bullish sign. You were near a bottom and it was time to get long. Could this time be different? It can always be different, but you go with probabilistic uh, um, data and you, you place your bets. Uh, macro charts, equity traders sold relentlessly into this rally, five consecutive weeks of selling since the February bottom, one of the biggest purges ever as a percent of market cap, spec positioning now massively short, at risk of further squeeze, similar setups led to major rallies, and it shows all the times that uh, uh, future spec positioning was this pessimistic, and what happened next, so that's the name of the game. When this reversal occurs, those who were chasing what has worked in the recent past are going to get let out through the trap door. As you can see from the recent table I edited below, the quote, the last shall be first. Right now, everyone wants commodities and no one wants emerging markets, i.e. China as it is the largest waiting by far. Right now, there's a one month vacancy and they're ready to take a 50% hit on the sale price of the asset. That's crazy land. But history shows over and over, the last shall be first and the mighty can fall from grace. And what I did here is I took this JP Morgan chart for the last decade. It showed how asset classes moved on a year to year basis. And what we see over and over was that what's at the top in one year tends to move to the bottom over the next year to two years. And what was top last year is commodities. Um, emerging markets was the worst. So what are we what were we getting out of in the first uh, first quarter last couple of months we've been getting out of. Uh, commodities and cyclicals, what were we getting into aggressively? We're getting into, uh, this is emerging markets, but the biggest weight of emerging markets is China tech. So we, uh, as you can see here, last time China, uh, China tech emerging markets, this purple bottom a box was on the bottom. Next year, it was in the middle of the pack. The year after, it was right towards the top of the pack. Uh, previous time it happened was 2015, went from second to bottom to the, to the top. 
in, a, in two periods from bottom to middle to top. Uh, last time before that was 2011. You can think of this purple one as China because it's 40% of emerging markets. Bottom to near top in one year. Last time before that was 2008, was the bottom in 2008, was the top in 2009, and over and over. Last time before that was 2002, uh, third from the bottom straight to the top in 2023. We know this, we, we're confident this is going to happen this time. Now let's look at commodities. It was at the top of the chart in 2000, it was at the bottom of the chart in 2001. It was at the top of the chart, uh, second to the top in 2005. It was at the bottom in 2006. It was at the second to the top in 2007. Went to uh, near the uh, fourth from the bottom in 2008. Uh, then was mid range and then got back up to the top after a huge sellout uh, for year bear market. It got to the top in 2016, dropped to third to the bottom in 2017. And now it's back at the top and we think it's going to drop in the short term. That doesn't change our secular view on commodities. We just want when they drop people out the trap door in the next few months, we'll be buying up again for the long, long term, depending how aggressively they drop. And the same is true, by the way, for some degree on the home builders, which have been left for dead. Uh, we think there's a little bit more pain to happen with the home builders, but we think there's going to be another secular buy opportunity in coming months along with commodities and energy. It's just too soon. They haven't sold off enough yet in our view. Um, we might be wrong on home builders. They might start to get bid sooner than we expect and we'll be okay with that, but we think there are gonna be better opportunities in coming months to load up with a longer term view. Uh, same on, on certain energy with a, with a three, three plus year outlook. Uh, we have not sold one share of uh, natural gas stocks, by the way. Um, Okay, emerging markets, China was the worst performer in 2021. We expect that'll change in 2022, just as it has every few years. Kamai has held the top spot this, that, uh, in 2021. That is unlikely to persist in 2022, despite the strong start. This is an out of consensus view. Follow the blue arrows for the emerging markets and China and follow the black arrows for commodities, then draw your own conclusions. It's so my friend from T.O. Birkin. He's, he's got a family office in... Um, Malta. He lives all over the world. And he said, consider Chinese stocks. If you bought at inception in 1992, your returns are pretty much flat after three decades. He was referring to the MSCI China. However, if you bought in 2001, just as the S&P 500 peaked and China stocks were in the gutter and held for 20 years, you outperformed every other major market. Timing is everything. And we think this is another opportunity here. We agree with Tiho and we've talked to him about it extensively. Here are some new charts from Goldman Sachs. They're starting to get bullish on China again. Um, and they just talk about the quantitative data with the multiples, which we've covered many times and how they expect it to return. And by the way, not only is the seasonality on the bonds uh, turning into full force here for the next six months, but if you look at the average performance uh, of Alibaba since inception, uh, they start to rally in early April and rally all the way until October, which lines up uh, actually beginning of November, which lines up with the China National Congress this year, which we've been talking about as a key catalyst for the MSCI China. And with BABA being such a huge weight, will be one of the biggest beneficiaries, always outperforms by at least double the upside performance in the MSCI during that period. Yes, I know you got shutdowns and I know you have all that stuff, but that's temporary. That's one month vacancy. Get over it. And um, and then we, we've just come off the worst period to hold Baba, which is November through April through actually late March. Early April is the worst part of the year. That's when it has the weakest performance. And now we're entering the strongest part of the year for seasonally speaking. Uh, and we are looking forward to that very, very much. So it's kind of your last few minutes of the blue light special for those of you who lived on the east coast and remember eddie lampert owed this company called kmart they had these blue light specials they'd flash the thing in the store and you'd go buy your trinkets and junk at uh uh you know half off prices or whatever and then the light would stop flashing and you could no longer get the sale well that's the exact same thing with alibaba they sell a lot of trinkets and junk but people love it and, uh, you know, that, and there's a huge business for it, as does Amazon, but that's the name of the game. So we want to follow in Amazon's footsteps. 
and Alibaba is about five years behind, not only on the retail business, but more importantly, which is going to be the huge driver moving forward, is the digitization of China uh, and the cloud business, which is going to be a monster. If you think about IoT and if you think about uh, all the factors that, that lay into that and the exposure that they have and the market share that they have in Southeast Asia, it's, it's unbelievable. So, um, all right, the next. The Fed minutes indicated that quantitative tightening balance sheet roll-off <clears throat> would begin in May and work up to $95 billion a month. Uh, pointing to our show notes from above, let's take a look at how uh, biotech performed during the last tightening cycle from 2016 to 2018. This is very important, actually. Um, so uh, this is from the St. Louis Fed. In So this chart is XBI, which is the small mid-cap equal, equal weighted I, ETF that we've been talking about. Labu tracks it on it as well. Uh, in December 2015, the Fed took the first step toward returning the policy rate to a more new, neutral level. They just did that last month. Uh, so that was down here. December, we just had that over here when they started raising rates. And um, to, uh, to Fed fund rates to, yeah, 25 basis points. Another increase in 2016. Three increases in 2017 and four increases in 2018 brought the target rate for the Fed funds rate to 225 to 250. After the policy rate had been raised a few times, the FOMC decided to begin reducing the size of the balance sheet. Hello, we just started that this week. Uh, the announcement as announced in September 2017, the balance sheet normalization program began the next month in October 2017. So here was the whole tightening cycle, the last tightening cycle from uh, 2016 to 2018. Notice that this XBI sold off 50% in anticipation of the tightening cycle. What just happened in the last year? The XBI sold off 50% in anticipation of the tightening cycle. Over the next two years, during tightening, XBI was up 141%. We anticipate we could have a similar type of outcome uh, over the next two years during this tightening cycle, because as GDP slows, biotech is less correlated to GDP growth than cyclicals where everyone's been crowding in as of late, looking in the rear view mirror. The time to do that was before your house is on fire. Uh, buying insurance against inflation was a 2020 trade to do, not a 2022 trade to do. Too late. Sorry, trap door is going to open. So, um, so, so we love this setup. Oh, and by the way, Guess when seasonality picks up for biotech? Early April and goes through when? All the way through fall. What did we just come off of? The weakest period of the year to own biotech. So now we're off to the races. And these, these are the periods that what were we doing? Loading up on biotech, loading up on BABA when no one wanted it and the world was ending. We were taking the bids for the 350000 on the $500,000 house all day long while people panicked out. We panicked in because we know the blue light special is going to end sooner or later and we want to have as much exposure as we can and went off to the races. So uh, the seasons are changing literally and figuratively, and we believe we're best positioned across the board to take advantage. So um, we covered that. And then for those wondering if defense stocks will persist in their recent strength as we anticipated in fall 2021, for those of you who were listening, uh, three and five months ago. Here's the chart I referenced in last week's podcast video cast. Expect more spending on defense in coming years. Couple it with providers that also make and service airplane engines for the travel recovery and you can't miss. And we can't uh, emphasize that enough. They're out of favor now. They're going to be very much in favor in the next two years and the blue light special will end soon. Um, don't leave the store without them. Now on to the shorter term market. Let's look at sentiment. This week it came down again. What was happening? All the people that got excited in the last week or two weeks after the market had retraced 50% of its losses, they got a pullback, they got scared, weak hands shaken out, the weak sisters are toast. The bearishness uh, went up to 41% from 27%. The bullishness dropped down to 24%. And we love that we use the weakness to our advantage. A National Association of Active Investment Managers, they got up to 80 some odd percent. They probably got shaken out this week on the fear along with the retail. We won't see that till next Thursday. Uh, and they're going to have to chase up as we move to new highs in coming months is our view. 
And then lastly was the fear and greed was in neutral uh, and um, nothing new there. That was pretty much the same as the previous week. That's a compilation of eight different indicators. Major economic news. The one thing that I would say that stood out to me, number one, you had the build in crude. Uh, oil's down now two weeks in a row. I think that's going to persist and you could get some other catalysts that we've talked about in recent weeks. We, we know they will come. We just don't know when. Continuing claims moved higher which was interesting, uh, 1.5, that was an enormous miss. That's the most important number when it comes to jobs versus 1.3 million expectations. So we may have hit the lows in uh, full employment for this cycle, and we may start to see these initial jobless claims, despite the fact that they were great this week. Uh, we may see, see them start to tick up in coming months, and then we'll feel the effect of that tightening, uh, like I said, six to 18 months out. Um, you know, if they can perfectly thread the needle on this soft landing, maybe we'll avoid a recession. But I, I do think we'll get a shallow recession. And that has nothing to do with what the market's going to do in the short term. Um, OK, let's move on to the questions of the week. We've got quite a few of them. For those of you on the podcast, you're going to get cut off in 10 minutes. Just go to hedgefundtips.com. Scroll down to the video cast. Fast forward to minute 60, you'll pick up exactly where you, we left off. But uh, we think that um, we think we'll be able to get through this pretty quickly. Okay, ask me anything question number one. Tom, this is from um, this is from Shannon Sabin. Tom, two connected questions this week. Number one, everyone in the media talks about the 210 spread, but is it really the spread that matters? When you look at the two 10-year, three-month spread, you see it is highly correlated with the 210 spread up until recently. So which one is really the indicator of choking off credit? Number two, when you talk about choking off credit, which data points can we look at that show this choking off? Is something available on Fred or another platform? Okay, so uh, the, you know, as soon as the two tens inverted, everyone came out and said, well, it's not really the two tens, it's now the three, three month, 10 year. Look, the two tens is probably the best indicator, uh, despite the San Francisco Fed, quote unquote, study. If you look all the way back, you're going to see that um, the three month, 10 year tends to be steep at the time that the two ten is inverting, and the two ten is the one that carries the weight. Now, where are you going to see it? You're going to start to see it in banks. Uh, towards the end of the year, you're going to start to see on a lagged basis, because it happens six to nine months out, it's felt in the real economy, is demand is going to slow, uh, their incentives to lend are going to slow, and you're going to start to see C&I loans start to come down. So just watch bank earnings. It won't be in this quarter. I think banks are coming into this quarter extremely weak. I think you probably could see a bounce with banks off of bank earnings. I think it's going to be positive. People are going to say, whew, it's not that bad. But it's rear view, rear view mirror numbers that you're getting. Curve wasn't inverted in Q1. So I think the next two quarters, probably another quarter will be a pass because you'll have momentum. Two quarters from now, you're going to start to see CNI and a bunch of the other loan metrics start to slow down. Uh, and uh, that'll be a precursor to what will be a shallow recession in 2023 in the scheme of a long-term secular bull market driven by the millennials. Um, so watch bank earnings to see their uh, loan volume across the board. Okay, next question is from Shannon Sabin. I sent this before listening to the podcast last week, and you talked fairly extensively about the first question. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay. We already did that. You asked me the question twice. So watch bank earnings. That's that's the key. Don't worry about Fred. All right. Um, this is from Sumit Kapoor. Uh, hi, Tom. You had been suggesting that Federal Reserve could use its balance sheet runoff rather than hike hiking funds rate as a tool to invert the 210 yield curve and avoid a recession. Not a tool to invert it, a tool to avoid inverting the yield curve and avoid a recession, to re-steepen the curve because it was flattening. Uh, I've tried to understand the meaning of your suggestion. Well, it's hard to understand it because you had it inverted. The key for selling off the long end of the curve was to create supply so yields went up while not increasing 
uh, aggressively on the short end of the curve to keep those rates subdued and the spread would widen, which would give banks incentive to lend more because their spread, the difference between what they pay for capital and what they charge for capital would increase and that would increase the flow of credit to the economy, which would keep the expansion going. So uh, she also goes on to say 95% of the balance sheet consists of uh, securities and nearly two thirds are treasury securities, including shorter term T-bills and bonds. Um, yes, and that's why I said they needed to start with the over 10 year maturity, which was uh, $1.4 trillion of the balance sheet. Uh, and that would be the name of the game. So um, let me just see here. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the point is they didn't do it quickly enough and they didn't listen to my podcast three months ago. <laughs> so, or they listened to it and they didn't follow it. But um, the long and the short of it is there's too much jawboning on the short, short end of the curve because they were trying to anchor long-term inflation expectations and uh, they inverted it. So this, this, this uh, kind of uh, uh, investigation that you're laying out here is no longer valid because the curve is inverted and it's too late. So, um, okay, next one from Brad. Uh, was hoping to inquire on your money management offering. Okay, this is, uh, I'll get back to you on that. Next one is from uh, Sumit Kapoor. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hope you're well. Saw this one on the Discord discussions on Chinese manufacturing sectoring analysts for March, 2022. Uh, apologize, ap apologies for being the harbinger of bad news. Uh, this, this is related to the uh, PMIs missed this month. Well, they shut down a city of 25 million people. Uh, it's no surprise that the PMIs dropped. It also hurts uh, consumer confidence. This is a case of, do you think they're going to be shut down a year from now? Do you think that the rental is going to be vacant for two years? No. And so therefore, what's the value of the business? Short term, they're going to pick up share because small businesses are going to get roasted from the shutdowns. Uh, and then as they revert back to trend, they'll probably overshoot trend because of the advantage of being the biggest player with the biggest share, even if they take a short term hit uh, from these exogenous events. Um, OK, so. Mark R getting near a good entry for long duration treasuries. <laughs> hey, yeah, that was the 45 percent of this podcast this week. Uh, yeah, I'm not a buyer of treasuries, but yes, I mean, I think I think treasuries are getting ready to bounce. Maybe you'll get one last flush out, but um, but I think we're moving into from a seasonal point of view, from all the other factors that we covered. I think bonds are better buy than a than a sell at the moment if you're looking at a short to intermediate term trade. Um, okay, this is from Shannon Sabin. I won't be offended if this is too long too much for an AMA, but if not, and since you discuss your position in mortgage companies in the past, I want to see what you think of some home builders. Specifically, I want to know if you can argue a bear case against why my thesis attached. Uh, what am I missing? Uh, no, you know, so here was, uh, by the way, the number one um, uh, mortgage business, uh, Rocket Company CEO, Jay Farner bought a half a million dollars of stock um this week in rocket companies everyone's saying get out of them because rates are going up the biggest part of the mortgage business was from 2003 to 2006 when rates were going through the roof off of a very low basis i think they went from like three percent mortgage rates went from like three percent to seven percent in three years and mortgage brokers made more money in those four years than they ever did uh in the history of the industry and um um, I, I remember I, I lived in Vegas actually for like six months in my early twenties. Uh, I was there on business and, um, and, uh, I remember playing golf with this mortgage broker that had moved out there from the East coast. And he was like, I don't know, he's 27 or something. And he was making a hundred, 150 grand a month. And he was the biggest moron I'd ever met. And it, and it, it, it shows you like what, <laughs> how, how much demand there was. And what's interesting about that period is you didn't have 
72 million millennials at average age of 31 looking to start housing formation, family formation, et cetera. So uh, I think that irrespective of this short-term spike, I think rates are actually going to moderate here and demand is going to only increase over the next five years in a dramatic way. So, so this weakness over the next few months in home builders is going to be an opportunity to buy for a huge secular move. Uh, I think in coming years, I think it's going to be a, a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. And, um, you know, Shannon goes through this. He does a nice, uh, let's see if I can pull this over here. Does this beautiful presentation here on, uh, you know, all the short-term data. But you can see here, you know, the best ideas you can do with a crayon, not a scalpel. And you can see we're totally underweight with housing supply. And he shows here the demographics of the U.S. Uh, here we've got the millennials at these young ages, which is really, really uh, huge and, uh, and, and are going to be the beneficiaries. So, no, I can't argue against it because I totally agree with it. I just think the timing, you got to wait to a lot of people got into housing aggressively after the huge move off the lows. Now they're getting shaken out. You got to see them bleeding for the exits. Like I, I never want to touch another housing stock as long as I live. I think we could get there in the next couple of months and then you just load the boat, uh, load the boat with some of your biotech profits. Although you're probably going to want to be in biotech for a lot longer and, and China tech than a few months. But um, uh, there you go. Um, this was an interesting article. Xi Jinping's common prosperity was everywhere, but China backed off. This is just more on they realized they overshot. They've been aggressively stimulating. Shutdowns are not helping them in the short term, but that'll change. Um, China removes key hurdle to allow U.S. full access to audits. We already covered that. Um, so they blinked on that front as well. Shanghai's workers sleep on floors to keep factories going amid COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, that was not evident in the PMI. Uh, what was evident in the PMI is they're dropping the ball. So that, you know, again, that's a short-term headwind. That's why investing is boring because you just wade through it versus people who want excitement, they panic out. And that's why they never make any real money. Uh, Shanghai residents rebel as cases surge. Lockdown extended indefinitely. This is from Wednesday. Uh, this is his biggest risk with the China National Congress. They're going to have to relent on zero COVID. And I think they will the second they have those generic, pill, gen generic uh, Pfizer pills made. They're going to be off to the races. That's the PMI that uh, Sumit referenced. And then um, I think we've got a couple other questions here. Let me see if I can pull them up. Um, yeah, I know that because a couple people were commenting on Michigan. I posted this article because there was a Wall Street Journal article about this Michigan hockey team. And then I got uh, all these great folks. Uh, Don said, Don Gaffney says, you put a smile on my face seeing the University of Michigan hockey photo, my alma mater, my family's a bunch of rink rats. Uh, all played ho college hockey, go blue. Okay. All right. Thanks, Don. And then uh, Prasad says, couldn't help but say go blue after seeing your photo lead for today's key reads list. I'm a proud alum. Question, can you get more in depth on so-called value tech? I assume the likes of Splunk last November, December would love to hear some other companies you like in the space and why. Uh, Look, the biggest value tech in the world right now is Alibaba, okay? Now, if you want some U.S. names, you want to think along the lines of Intel, you want to think along the lines of maybe a Qualcomm or a Taiwan Semiconductor, uh, certainly a Facebook, but that's run up from when we were talking about it in the 190s. Uh, it went against in the short term to 180s. Now it's up to 230. So that window is kind of closed. Maybe you'll get another bite at the apple there. Um Lastly, looking forward to this week's podcast. Uh, again, video cast. Thanks for your generosity and sharing your knowledge, experience, and analysis with all of us. I feel like I've been in an advanced investing course this past one and a half years, reading your posts and listening to your video cast. Well, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate that, Prasad, and I'm glad that you're finding it helpful. Uh, and that's that. Uh, we covered uh, Shannon's uh, housing presentation, which was terrific. Uh, we agree. We just think you got to wait for a little bit. And other than that, I think we're good for the week and want to thank everyone for tuning in. We'll be back next week. Same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.